In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So we learned some things from the last one. Some of you couldn't hear me last time because I had them lower the microphone. The reason I had them do that is for me, the sound is coming from behind me. So imagine talking and then hearing your voice come from behind you. It throws off your rhythm, right? It's not great. Uh, I do invite you to come closer. If you're having a hard time hearing, Go ahead and fill in. You guys are doing the Catholic thing. Sit as fur- furthest way as you can, right? Okay, I'm not going to fly through this one quite as fast as I did the other one. The other one was just to get us theologically in the right foundation. Now we're going to actually be talking about the development of the liturgy. So we're going to take it a little bit slower because I'm going to be talking about things some of you have never heard of. Okay. The other thing I learned is uh, the poor person trying to follow me with the camera last time, I kept walking back and forth going right out of frame. Um, we will eventually go back and do post-editing of the videos. They'll be up on YouTube. And the slides will be put into the video itself so that people can follow the slides as well. Okay, sacred liturgy. Development of the liturgy in the first three centuries. There is a paucity of documentation. That means there's not a lot of it. What illusions we have tend not to be precise, assuming that readers understand what is being alluded to, or exercising the disciplina arcani, which, in other words, you don't talk about the holy things in front of others who aren't, don't belong to you. And you don't want anyone to stumble upon the holy things because they might take your holy things and do something with them that you don't want. So there's a, there's a discipline of the secret. A number of influences directly or indirectly affect the liturgy. The expulsion of Christians and their persecution by Jewish authorities led to the breaking away of the early church. The evangelizing tendency in faraway places like Greece and Rome make it hardly possible to continue a connection with temple liturgies. Finally, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the diaspora together with the ongoing persecution of the Christian community. So when the Jewish temple is destroyed, Jews are dispersed throughout the empire, right? What they, what they leave in Jerusalem, it's uninhabitable. It's unlivable. Influences and limitations. We'll be coming back to these kind of again and again because there's something that we don't think about. Language and culture, persecutions, Ecclesial controversies, location. Let's talk about language and culture. There's a heightened juridical sense of Rome and Latin. So even in the Eastern Empire, uh, the canons use, use Latin. The law is Latin. Latin is a very concise very precise language. And so the juridical aspects of the culture are, are going to be felt in the language itself. Semitic concreteness of Aramaic, Syriac, of Hebrew. Um, so the Hebrew Psalms will say, the Lord is my shield. The Greek translation of that will say, the Lord is my protector. See the difference in the way that they 
express themselves. The Semitic languages are very concrete. They point to things. That's why they say things like, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, right? Or we might say, the Lord is my, is my supporter, my defender, right? The abundant literature of Greece and the philosophers. So Greek already has um, a language that deals with um, rhetoric, poetry, romance. Greek is uh, an effusive language. So the character of Greek is going to make its influence felt in Greek liturgies. The difference in expressions of each of these and the common imagination of the people. We don't often think about it. But if you grow up here, and you grow up speaking English, it's not just the language that you speak and express yourself in. That language has formed the way that you think. You think in English. The, the syntax of the grammar of English has trained you to think in a particular way. Um, when you learn a second language and a third language, your mind opens up. You begin to think in a different way. So language that you grow up in, it actually affects your ability to receive something. Persecutions. Christians are effectively thrown out of the temple and out of synagogue worship very early on. So there's a break, right? The next stage of persecutions for the early church is the Roman imperial persecutions. And sometimes they would persecute. Sometimes even though it was illegal, no one did anything about it. And then there'd be a new persecution that, that rose up again. All the way until Christianity becomes legal in the Roman Empire. So from fairly early on in Christianity until, I mean, really fourth century, there's these persecutions that keep popping up. Not until Christianity has buildings dedicated to the purpose of worship can there be a development of the parts of liturgy. We'll come back to that. Ecclesial controversies. Um, as people start to hear about Christianity and maybe even receive it from uh, those who knew the apostles, they begin to think on their own. Sometimes that goes well, sometimes it goes really, really poorly. Because there's always a tendency to interpret Christianity through the lens of what you already know. So you have the rise of the heresy of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is a heresy, gnosis in Greek, it means knowledge. And so it's the idea of a Christianity that's it's intended to illuminate you. You have to be a right thinker. And then out of that rises a whole bunch of separations. And eventually what you get to is the spiritual is good. Right? Intelligence is good. The body is either indifferent or it's evil. Docetism. Docetism wants to say, um, dokeo, to seem to appear in the Greek. Docetism says, God didn't really die on the cross. He just appeared to. The second person of the Most Holy Trinity didn't really become flesh. He just appeared to. Because God is immutable. The divine is unchangeable. 
adoptionism. Um, would have been 190 AD. Adoptionism is the idea that either at the baptism or at the resurrection or at the ascension, depending on the various authors, God adopted Jesus as the Son of God. And so in that adoption, he became divine. But it denies the eternal existence of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity. Marcionism. Uh, we have all kinds of Marcionites today in Christianity. Marcion said, the God of the Old Testament, bad God, out to get you. Destroyed all sorts of things. And so we don't need any of the Old Testament. All we need is the New Testament. That's a different God. That's Marcionism. Sabellianism. Sabellianism is, um, it's modalism. There is only one God, but there are not three distinct persons. That one God appears in one of three forms. Right? These are different conceptions of Christianity. And so these controversies will mean that liturgical prayers will be shaped either for or against them. If, if this is your way of thinking, right, when you pray, your way of thinking is going to slip into the way that you express your prayers. And if you're utterly against it, you're going to make sure to pray in such a way that it corrects anyone that thinks this way. So you'll say things like, um, Jesus really, truly died a horrible, painful death upon the cross. And the one who died was our God. You see how you're excluding the idea that he only appeared to be human. Location. The other thing that uh, influences liturgy, famous bishops, theologians, and saints leave their mark on the local liturgy. So the way that they preach, people remember it. You might just remember a phrase here or a phrase there. And so when you form a prayer for the liturgy, you're going to borrow this phrase from a famous bishop. The same way that we might do when we pray, if we're really deep in scripture, even sometimes without realizing it, we start to bring these phrases from the Psalms and from the gospel into our prayers. We start to express it in that way. So really holy, wise bishops, theologians, and saints, they start to shape the way that we pray. The prestige of the local church makes its influence felt. Rome, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, Milan. If you, if you live in a backwater town and Rome is really, really important, you might just start copying what you see going on in Rome because it's one of the most influential cities in your little area. And so you start to mimic the things of the most important churches, the way that they're doing things. Okay, documents. <clears throat> the Didache, or the teaching of the Lord through the 12 apostles to the Gentiles. The document is mentioned by early Christian writers. Much of the material is incorporated in other documents, and it's rediscovered in 1875 in a complete 11th century Greek manuscript in the library at Constantinople. So a document that we knew existed because the fathers talk about it, we find an 11th century manuscript of it. St. Ignatius of Antioch, he died in 107 AD. Bishop of Antioch in Syria, martyred in Rome. In several of his letters, 
he expounds his Eucharistic doctrine. St. Justin Martyr wrote his famous apologies, that's a Greek word that means defense, to the emperor Antoninus Pius around 155 AD. The most complete description of the Eucharistic liturgy that we have. Also wrote his dialogue with Trypho. So essentially what you have, Justin was a Roman who converted to Christianity. And so he writes, he was a philosopher, seemed to have some prestige. He writes a letter to the emperor in Rome and he describes a, <coughs> a baptismal liturgy and a Sunday liturgy. Now he doesn't give us a word for word, but he gives us the shape of what the liturgy looks like. Saint Irenaeus of Lyon wrote his famous treatise Adversus Heresis against the heresies. He was a disciple of Saint Polycarp who was taught by Saint John the Evangelist himself. So Saint Irenaeus was around 130 AD to 202 AD. Saint Hippolytus of Rome the controversial supposed author of the document Apostolic Traditions. Hippolytus died in 235 AD. The manuscripts of Apostolic Traditions that we have range from 5th century to 13th century. So those are the copies. If Saint Hippolytus is the author, he would have had to have written this before he died in 235 AD. Uh, Rome, Alexandria, and Syria are all given as locations of origin for St. Hippolytus. The scholars disagree with each other. One theory suggests the St. Hippolytus is not the Hippolytus of authorship. So there's another Hippolytus that wrote apostolic traditions, and it's not that one. How they could know that, I don't know, right? But everyone's <laughs> got theories around these documents. So let's start with the Didache. Scholars disagree. Some thinking that it is from the apostolic period, others from the second century. Some scholars think it's from Egypt, some think it's from Palestine, some think it's from Syria. Scholars are divided on how to interpret this text. A common opinion is that it is in reference to the agape meal, the love meal, and not to the Eucharist proper. St. Paul alludes to this when he talks about you guys come together and you eat and drink and the poor go without and you have your fill and some of you get drunk. So in the very early times, it, you didn't just show up for church, say your prayers, get your communion and out the door you went. It was a a communal event and there was a meal, a full meal connected to it, right? Not just a, a cardboard thin uh, wafer. There was an actual meal that took place. Okay, so this is from the text of the Didache. This is chapter 9. Now concerning the Eucharist, give thanks in this way. First concerning the cup, we thank you, our Father, for the holy vine of David, your servant, which you made known to us through Jesus, your servant, to you be glory forever. And concerning the broken bread, we thank you, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you made known to us through Jesus, your servant, to you be glory forever. Even as the bread was scattered over the hills and was gathered together and became one, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom, for yours is the glory and power through Jesus Christ forever. But let no one eat or drink of the Eucharist unless they have been baptized into the name of the Lord. 
For concerning this also the Lord has said, Give not that which is holy to the dogs. We don't use rough language like that anymore, do we? But you can see several points that coincide with the way that we would think about the Eucharist, but it's expressed in in a different way. It's not quite as precise as we would like it to be. Chapter 10 from the Didache. But after you are filled, give thanks this way. We thank you, Holy Father, for your holy name, which you caused to dwell in our hearts, and for the knowledge and faith and immortality, which you made known to us through Jesus, your servant, to you be the glory forever. Almighty Master, you created all things for your name's sake. You gave food and drink to men for enjoyment, that they might give thanks to you. But to us, you freely gave spiritual food and drink, and life eternal through your servant. Before all things, we thank you that you are mighty. To you be glory forever. Remember, Lord, your church to deliver it from all evil and to make it perfect in your love. And gather it from the four winds, sanctified for your kingdom, which you have prepared for it. For yours is the power and glory forever. Let grace come and let this world pass away. Hosanna to the God of David. If anyone is holy, let him come. If anyone is not so, let him repent. Maranatha. Amen. And then it instructs, but permit the prophets to give thanks as much as they desire. So whatever the author of the Didache is doing, he's saying, here's an example of how to go about giving thanks before and after this meal, whether that be the Eucharist proper or the love feast. But even having given us instruction to give thanks in this way, if there are prophets among you, let them talk as long as they want. Chapter 14 of the Didache. Every Lord's Day, gather yourselves together and break bread and give thanks after having confessed your transgressions that your sacrifice may be pure. But let no one who is at odds with his fellow come together with you until they be reconciled, that your sacrifice may not be profaned. For this is that which is spoken by the Lord. In every place and time, offer to me a pure sacrifice, for I am a great king, says the Lord and my name is feared among the nations. <clears throat> so you do have a sense in the text of a giving of thanks, the term of Eucharist, and then the identification on the Lord's day of breaking bread and calling it a sacrifice. So this, this document might be as early as almost the earliest letter of the New Testament. It might be as late as second century, but it still gives us a witness, historical witness, to what some Christians were doing, right? We don't know how to incorporate that into what everyone was doing, but at least some Christians were praying in this way. So let's turn to St. Ignatius of Antioch. This is in his letter to the Smyrnaeans, that's chapter eight. See that you follow the bishop, even as Jesus Christ follows the Father. Follow the priests as you would follow the apostles. And reverence the deacons as you would reverence the command of God. Let no man do anything connected to the church without the bishop. Let that be deemed a proper Eucharist, which is administered either by the bishop or by one to whom he has entrusted it. 
Wherever the bishop shall appear, there let the assembly also be, just as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Apart from the bishop, it is not lawful to baptize or to celebrate an agape. But whatever he shall approve is pleasing to God, so that everything that is done may be secure and valid. For all those who belong to God and to Jesus Christ are also with the bishop. And all those who repent and return to the unity, oh, I gotta go back, of the church shall also belong to God, that they may live according to Jesus Christ. Do not be deceived, my brethren. If anyone follows a man who makes schism in the church, he shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If anyone walks according to a strange opinion, he disagrees with the passion of Christ. Take care then to have only one Eucharist. For there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ and one cup to show forth the unity of his blood. One altar, as there is one bishop, along with priests and deacons, my fellow servants. All this is so, so that whatever you do, you may do it according to the will of God. So you've already got in the early second century the structure of bishops, priests, and deacons. The idea of a church to which you must belong, that if you break with that church, you cut yourself off from the source of grace. This is Justin Martyr from the first apology. So we'll be going through uh, chapters 65, 66, and 67. <clears throat> After we have washed someone who has been convinced and accepted our teaching, we bring him to the place where those who are called brethren are assembled. Together then we offer hearty prayers for ourselves, for the enlightened person, and for all others in every place. After the prayers, we greet one another with a kiss. Then bread <clears throat> and a cup of wine mixed with water are brought to the president of the brethren. Taking them, he gives praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And he offers thanks at considerable length that we have been counted worthy to receive these things from his hands. When he has concluded the prayers and thanksgivings, all the people present, present express their assent by saying, Amen. This word is Hebrew for so be it. And when the president has given thanks and all the people have expressed their assent, those whom we call deacons distribute to each of those present a portion of the bread and wine mixed with water, over which the thanksgiving was pronounced. To those who are absent, they, the deacons, carry away a portion. This food we call the Eucharist. And no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that our doctrines are true, who has been washed with the bath for the remission of sins and rebirth, and who is living as Christ commanded. We do not receive these as common bread and drink. For Jesus Christ, our Savior, made flesh by the word of God, has both flesh and blood for our salvation. Likewise, we have been taught 
that the food blessed by the prayer of his word and from which our own blood and flesh are nourished and changed is the flesh and blood of Jesus who was made flesh. The apostles in the memoirs they compose called Gospels have passed on to us what was given to them, that Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks said, do this in memory of me, this is my body. In the same way, after taking the cup and giving thanks, he said, this is my blood and he gave it to them alone. So that's the baptismal liturgy that he describes. You should have heard all kinds of things in there that jive with what you see on the average Sunday. The next chapter, he gives a Sunday liturgy. On the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or countryside gather in one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has finished, the president instructs and exhorts them to imitate these good things. Then we all rise together and pray. When our prayer is ended, bread and wine with water are brought forth, and the president offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability. The people assent, saying, Amen. And there is distribution to each of the Eucharistic elements. The deacons carry a portion to those who are absent. I want to draw attention to the president offers prayers and thanksgiving according to his ability. In these early days of the church, they're not walking around with books like I do on a Sunday. I'm given the prayers that I say. I'm not supposed to change those prayers. Um, it does make it a little bit easier to get a priest because you don't have to make sure that he's a good speaker, right? You could have a priest that speaks too long. You could have a priest that's too brief. The church gives us a text now. But in those days, that is not how it was. And it's why, as you study history, you'll see St. John Chrysostom, he didn't want to be a bishop. St. Augustine, he didn't want to be a bishop. But the people of God, knowing that they were going to have to listen to someone talk for three hours, said, you, <laughs> you're our bishop. They wanted good, not just preaching, but good prayer. Think about all the times we try to pray extemporaneously. How good are we at it? Most of us kind of stink. God doesn't care. But we do these things like in, in my, I have my own habits. So you'll see me make this gesture all the time. I move my hands. I can't help it. That's the way I am. Uh, one time in seminary recording ourselves for homilies, I was moving my hands so much, the camera was focusing in and out trying to capture it. And I can't stop. If I put my hands in my pocket, it's almost like I can't speak. And I say, right, question mark, a lot. And I've tried to stop myself and I can't. We have patterns to our speech. Someone that's really trained in rhetoric and oration they get rid of all of the ums, all of those little patterns. They know how to make the cadences of the words rise and fall. Uh, they, they know language so well that they can make whatever they say appear to be beautiful. Well, if you're going to sit through a three-hour liturgy, that's the guy you want in charge of making up the prayers. Okay, let me do it, and then we won't, we won't keep going back and forth. All right. All right. Those who are able gave willingly whatever sum they each think is appropriate. The money collected is deposited with the president 
We don't do that anymore. He gives it then to comfort orphans, widows, and those who are wanting through sickness or any other cause, and those who are imprisoned and strangers traveling among us. In a word, he takes care of all who are in need. Sunday is when we hold our assembly because it is the first day on which God brought forth the world from darkness and matter. On the same day, Jesus Christ, our Savior, rose from the dead, for he was crucified on a day before Saturn's day, and on the day after Saturn's day, which is the day of the sun, he appeared to his apostles and disciples and taught them these things, which we have submitted to you for your consideration. So this is a witness from the middle of the second century, and you should have heard in that second one so many things that show that what we're still doing today, uh, they're connected all the way back. We didn't just at some point decide to make these things up, right? We're doing what was handed on to us. Okay, St. Irenaeus of Lyon. Now, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, he only touches the Eucharist uh, insofar as he's trying to overcome the Gnostic heresies. Those who don't believe in the resurrection, those who think the flesh is of no avail. And so he's appealing to a common doctrine of the Eucharist in order to overcome those who think material fleshly things are bad. And what that requires is that those to whom he's appealing believe that the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, his argument has no force. And so he writes, moreover, how can they say that the flesh, which is nourished with the body of the Lord and with his blood, goes to corruption and does not partake of life? Let them either change their opinion or stop offering the things just mentioned. But our way of thinking is attuned to the Eucharist, and the Eucharist confirms our way of thinking. For we offer to him his own, announcing consistently the fellowship and union of the flesh and spirit. For the bread which is produced from the earth is no longer common bread. Once it has received the invocation of God, it is then the Eucharist, consisting of two realities, earthly and heavenly. So also our bodies, when they receive the Eucharist, are no longer corruptible, but have the hope of the resurrection to eternity. We sacrifice to him, not as though he needed it, but giving thanks for his gift, and thus sanctifying what has been created. For even though God does not need our possessions, we do need to offer something to God. As Solomon said, he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. God who stands in need of nothing takes our good works to himself for this purpose, that he may reward us with his own good things. As our Lord said, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. He does not stand in need of these services, yet he wants us to render them for our own benefit, lest we be unfruitful. That is why the Word gave people that very precept regarding the making of oblations. Although he stood in no need of them, that they might learn to serve God. It is his will that we too should offer a gift at the altar frequently and without intermission. The altar, then, is in heaven, for toward that place are our prayers 
and oblations directed. The temple, too, is there. As John said in the book of Revelation, then God's temple in heaven was opened along with the tabernacle. Behold, he says, the tabernacle of God in which he will dwell with men. So you can hear all the echoes of things that you should hear. He, we offer to God, um, we offer him his own. The Eastern liturgies are full of that phrase. Um, there's, there's the idea of sacrifice, the idea that the sacrifice is done for us, not for God. God grows no greater because of our praise. We are the ones that need to worship him. That's how he made us. Okay, this is the text of the apostolic tradition attributed to St. Hippolytus. You should recognize this prayer. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is proper and right. We give thanks, O God, through your beloved child, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent us in these last days as Savior, Redeemer, and messenger of your counsel. He is your word, inseparable from you, through whom you created all things and in whom you are well pleased. From heaven you sent him into the womb of the virgin, and once conceived within her, he was made flesh and was shown to be your son, born of the Holy Spirit and the virgin. Fulfilling your will and winning for you a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he suffered that by his death he might free those who believed in you. When he was betrayed to his willing death, so that he might abolish death, break the bonds of the devil, trample hell underfoot, and manifest the resurrection. He took bread, and giving thanks to you, said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. In the same way the cup, saying, This is my blood which is shed for you. When you do this, do so in memory of me. And so keeping in mind his death and resurrection, we offer you the bread and cup, giving thanks because you have counted us worthy to stand before you and serve you. We pray that you would send the Holy Spirit upon the offerings of your church. Gathering them together, grant that all your saints who partake may be filled with the Holy Spirit, that their faith may be confirmed in truth that we may praise you and give you glory through your child, Jesus Christ, through whom be glory and honor with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> okay, controversies around this text. The text does not exist in its complete original form. It is found in a Sahidic version as the Egyptian church order. It is also published in a Boharic, Coptic, Ethiopic, and Arabic textual version. The Greek text, which is probably original, is only found in fragments. The Verona Palimpsest is in Latin. The 9th century Ethiopic text of the Aksumite collection lacks the anaphora, the Eucharist of prayer, that piece that we just read. A fuller version clearly depended upon the original anaphora remains in use in the Ethiopic church as the anaphora of the apostles. Okay. I think we'll end it there for the night and then pick up next Wednesday at the same place because that gives us about 15 minutes to chat over all this stuff. Right? Questions? Presider, whoever's, whoever's head, right? Priest or a bishop. Um, because he's talking to a Roman emperor, he might not be using the term priest just because that's going to have pagan overtones. So he's just basically saying, whoever the dude is that's in charge, this is how he does it. So she asked me why, why it said president instead of priest. That's why. Any other questions? I think it was San Ignatius of Antioch. There was this phrase I didn't understand. 
Take care then to have only one Eucharist. I don't know if I flew over my head. What was the, what's that one? Don't, don't split into groups. We do it all the time. Oh, I really like that Father Keith over at St. Anne's. I think I'll go to church there because I like him. Ooh, I really do not like that Father Keith at St. Anne's. Boy, I think I'll go to St. Mary Magdalene because at least that priest isn't as bad. He's a good priest. He's my friend. <laughs> That's what he's talking about. Don't be splitting into these other things. And don't be doing the double dipping thing. So this one is the Eucharist of the bishop. Right? You kind of like hanging out with these Gnostics over here. And you partake of their Eucharist too. There's one Eucharist. Now, their cities were not as big as ours. Right? There, was, there was no city back then that had four million inhabitants. So we are one church in the Diocese of Phoenix. And everywhere that the Eucharist in union with our local ordinary celebrated one Eucharist. I just, we can't build a building big enough to squeeze us all in, right? But Arianism doesn't come till fourth century. So I'm talking about the first three centuries. We'll get into it. <laughs> I wanted to throw it in there. I wanted to throw a bunch of stuff in there and I had to keep going, nah, that's not that century. It's not that century. Right. Remember the, con remember the context of the Eucharist in, in, the, in the last session? He's asking about the way they describe it seems more like a meal where there's bread and wine shared. It's a fuller, fuller thing that's going on. But the very context of the institution of the Eucharist is within the context of a Passover meal. So the very earliest Christians are going to take that context with them. And they're going to continue those pieces. Some of the Jewish roots of having the Passover meal with all other kinds of things, right? In the Last Supper, it wasn't just bread and wine. There was a lot of other stuff going on there. So why don't we do the full meal anymore? As time progressed, we zeroed in with reflection and contemplation that the essence of of what Christ instituted as constituted in the bread being consecrated and the cup with wine being consecrated. So that some of the elements of those practices, they weren't essential to the underlying meaning of the Eucharist. But bread and a cup of wine mixed with water, the church decided was and then other things developed around that. Does that make some sense? Okay. So he's asking, um, in that document, it was describing uh, if you had some type of transgression, um, you couldn't partake in the Eucharist. And then what did you do about that? Did they, did they go to confession? In the earliest days, confession was public. You stood up before the community and you confessed your sins in the hearing of everyone. That might keep you from sinning, right? What we do is uh, this private auricular confession. Auricular just means hearing with the screen so that the priest doesn't know who you are. That comes to us from the Irish monks. The way we do it is different than the way it was done 
in the early church, right? Now the essence is the same. You proclaim your sins and you receive forgiveness from those to whom God has entrusted it. Uh, I would rather have what we do. <laughs> I can't hear you. Saturday. Uh, so that's just a literal translation. We would say Saturday. That's where we get the word Saturday from. It's Saturn's day, just like Thursday is Thor's day, right? So he said the day before Saturn's day, that's Friday. Romans didn't have words for the, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They called it Feria 1, Feria 2, Feria 3, Feria 4, Feria 5. And then they had names for Saturday and Sunday. So he said the day before Saturn's day, he died, right? On Saturn's day, he was buried. The day after Saturn's day, which is Sunday, that's when we celebrate. All the way back there. No way I'm going to hear you. Okay, I think I get the sense of your question. So he's asking with, with documents like the Didache or the Apostolic Traditions, uh, how much certitude can we have given that most manuscripts didn't survive? We just have the ones that, that happen to survive, right? So how do we know that there's not other documents out there that are completely different than what we find in these? I mean, the basic answer is we don't. We, I can't tell you anything about documents that we don't have. What I can say is <clears throat> the most important documents are the ones that are copied again and again and again and again and again. So it gives you some sense. It may not prove their, their genuineness as apostolic documents, but it will show you that uh, through the centuries, these documents were copied down and handed on, preserved and cared for because they were important to the communities who had them. And so it does give us a historical witness to how those communities thought. Well, this is the tricky work of dealing with historical documents. Their interpretation, their translations, I mean, I'll give you an example. In all these documents, you, you'll keep seeing the word eucharistain, which is a Greek word, to give thanks. And you won't know immediately, is he just saying give thanks, like, hey, thank you for doing that for me? Or is he talking about the Eucharist proper to make Eucharist? Because they use that verb in the same way. And so there's all kinds of scholarly debate between people with different ideologies and presuppositions as to whether St. Ignatius of Antioch means this or whether he means this. The second problem you have is they sometimes use terms that later fall out of use or they aren't, they aren't being as precise as we would later be. So there's an evolution of terminology that takes place. So someone might call the whole thing, while it's still celebrated together, the fuller mill with, with the bread and wine that uh, has the word of prayer spoken over it. They might call that whole thing the love feast, agape. It, it's only uh, recently 
uh, amongst Catholics that we even call it Eucharist and common parlance. Uh, those who grew up before the council, the, you go to Mass. We called it Mass. And most of you would say, if you were catechized well, you went to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Right? So there's a terminology and interpreting it to the author's original intent isn't always easy. So the best that we can do with these documents, I mean, for me, knowing what my practice is as a priest, what I do every day of my life, when I see a document from the second century that seems to line up with what it is that I gave my life for, I'm kind of like, ah, I'm going to give it some credence. But that doesn't make the document infallible. And my faith does not rest on any of these documents. I do what I do as a priest because Holy Mother Church gives them to me. She is the guardian of tradition. She knows what's been passed on to the apostles. And the only source I can go to get that authentic tradition is from Holy Mother Church. And that's why I have faith that what I do is secure and valid. But it is interesting to look at the historical documents to help see how these things developed. Now, we're pretty certain that even in the West, they used leavened bread for the Eucharist up until late medieval times. And then there was a switch that was made. Um, that seems the most likely account. They would have been leavened. I mean, we have a... What was it six or seven century document, um, the Ordinance Romani? So it's a description of the papal liturgy in Rome that gives the rubrics and how it takes place. And it talks about loaves. And it talks about um, bags, and, and there's a breaking of it. it they're not using hosts. Hosts come much, much later on. And then some of the art that we can see from those earlier times when it shows the kind of bread that would have been brought for the liturgy it looks like a little bun which is a it is the way that it's still done in the east you sometimes get bigger ones you sometimes get little ones uh, but that we're almost positive that we were using leavened bread in the west up until a certain point Yeah, so what you're dealing with in those first centuries is you have a church that's underground. Remember, there's, there's ongoing persecutions. So it's not like they can uh, call a council of all the bishops because Rome would be like, wonderful, we can get you all at once, right? So what you, what you essentially have is uh, renowned holy bishops that have some writings that help us see what they're fighting against, the kind of divisions and dissensions in the church. Does that make sense? So it's not, not formal in the way that it will be later where, you know, at Nicaea they summon people to Nicaea and they say like, here's the faith, accept it or not. It didn't quite go down like that. All right, we're about to the end of our time. Uh, so we'll, we'll pray. I'll stay for a little bit if people have questions they want to ask in private. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgins of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come before thee, I stand sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. Before you go, one last thing. So, most of what I've done, there's this great book by Mike Aquilina, The Mass of the Early Christians, and he gives you the text. So you can go through, there's more than what I put in here, right? I'm just touching what I think are the more important ones. This is a very easy read. This is the Eucharist of the Early Christians, uh, put together by Pueblo Publications, and they have articles on various of those documents. This is scholarly. They'll tell you what all the scholars think about this. Who interprets it this way? Who interprets this that way? They'll give you this phrase in Greek. They'll talk about this manuscript and all of the controversies around it. It's a much easier read. This will allow you to form your own opinion. All right?